So trials, Satan uses trials to push us to do things that we don't really want to do, but they're weak areas in us. And we wish that God would remove them, but many times he doesn't remove them when we want him to because he wants that weakness to keep surfacing until we finally say, I am not going to live like this, God. I don't care what you have to do, but change me. Come on, is anybody home in the house tonight? Change me. Now, you know, we're not serving dessert here in Hershey this weekend. You can get all the chocolate you want around the town. But tonight we're having meat and vegetables. It's grow up time in the body of Christ. Amen. Well, Joyce, I just wish you'd lay hands on me and make these problems go away. Don't work like that. You got to learn how to face your own Goliath. I can pray for you that you'll be strong to endure the things that come. You know what? I don't know that very many of us would have wanted the Apostle Paul to pray for us because I can't find one place in the Bible where he prayed for anybody's problem to go away, including his own. Do you know that? You can't find a place. You look at Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, Philippians, and you'll see the prayers of Paul recorded, and he prayed that people would know God, that they would know the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of the love that he had for them, that they would be strengthened with all might and power through the Holy Spirit indwelling their innermost being and personality, that they would endure whatever came with good temper. He never prayed for it to go away. He prayed for God to do something in them. So I think that we just pray wrong. We may spend years and years praying wrong. Some people may spend their whole life praying prayers that God can't answer. So we need to learn to pray, God, you've already told me in your word the temptation is going to come, but I'm praying that when it comes, that I'm going to recognize it from the onset, and I'm praying right now that I will not come into that temptation. Know yourself. Know your weaknesses. Know the areas that the enemy is going to hit you with, and be ready. I believe the word endure, this is my definition means to outlast the devil. How many of you made your mind up that you're going to outlast the devil? That's exactly what Jesus did in Luke chapter 4. He, he outlasted the devil. The devil threw everything at him that he possibly could. And Jesus remained strong. I can feel some of you growing right now. I can even feel some of you groaning right now. Oh, this is not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> oh, well. Let's just look at the first two verses first in Luke 4. Then Jesus, full of and controlled by the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led in by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> For during 40 days in the wilderness, in the desert, where he was tempted and tried, tested exceedingly, by the devil. And there was a lot of different temptations. He was tempted with things. He was tempted to try, twice try, tempted to try to, what well, if you are the son of God, then do this. And there's a lot of times when Satan will move us off of the will of God, trying to get us to prove something. I don't think anybody can ever be really free until you no longer have anything to prove or anybody to impress. Do I need to say it again? I don't think anybody's ever really free till you no longer have anything to prove and nobody to impress. When you can be genuinely and fully you and know that you're loved for you and accepted for you and that you don't have to prove anything. Amen? My, my, my. But verse 13, Luke 4, 13. And when the devil had ended every, the complete cycle of temptation, <laughs> he temporarily left him, that is, stood off from him until another more opportune and favorable time. My goodness, does anybody see that? Woo! 
Now, when the devil had ended the complete cycle, trial after trial after trial after trial, you know, it wouldn't have been so bad if Israel would have just had to have dealt with one thing today trying to get here. I don't know the full story yet, but I think you got to wherever Philadelphia, is that right? You were coming from Africa, I think somebody said. So, nice and tired, I know, jet lag, I get that. And his clothes didn't get there. So they said, well, they're on the next plane, it'll be 30 minutes. They thought, well, 30 minutes, I got plenty of time, I'll wait. Well, they still weren't on that plane. So, I think the story I heard was then you got lost trying to get here, something like that, something like that. And then uh, he wasn't all that far away, and the police stopped him. <laughs> and he was just as nice to that policeman as he could possibly be, but he still got three tickets. <laughs> trying to get to this conference to lead worship for God's people. They had to go to the outlet mall and buy him some clothes because he still has no clothes except what he has on his body. Amen? But you know what? We really, I mean, it's so tempting to go, oh. <laughs> and yes, there is empathy and sympathy there, but he grew. <laughs> Those of you who had no problems today did not grow. But Israel grew. Amen. And we need to be happier about our growth than what we are. Growing is painful, but we need to be happy about growth. Thank you, God, that I'm growing. Amen. And see, the thing is, is no matter what the devil comes up with, if we can just remain stable. And keep a good confession and continue to give praise to God and not get on the way, I don't understand why this had to happen to me. I don't understand. I'm just trying to be good and go lead worship. And I'm just, and you just don't understand. <laughs> I've been to Africa doing mission work and now look what's happened to me and I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so tired and I've got jet lag and why did this have to happen now? I got it about right somewhere in there. <laughs> you know why I know? Because I've been there and done that so many times that I don't even know how to tell you how many times I've been there and done that. And my husband just has a wonderful saying. Whenever the devil starts, he says out loud, I am not impressed. <laughs> I am just not impressed. Well, I'll tell you what, there was a lot of years where I was impressed. And he always says, if you don't get impressed, then you can't get oppressed, and you can't get depressed, and you can't get possessed. It all starts with letting what the devil does impress you. Oh, no. Oh, no. Not this. We don't even need to go in all that. Our first thing needs to be, I am going to make it through this, and I, with God's help, I'm going to come out victorious on the other side. That's when we confess, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not when we want to go build a worldwide ministry and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. I know how to behave the same whether I'm in plenty or whether I'm in lack. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. You say, well, man, you make it sound like life's going to be pretty painful. No, the whole point is, is every, every time that we grow and God changes us a little, no matter what the devil does, now it's less painful to us. It's not more painful, it's less painful. You've got to defeat Goliath before he's ever going to leave you alone. David was anointed to be king 20 years before he wore the crown. And one of the most important things he did was face Goliath. Jesus was tempted. We see it here in Luke. We see it in Hebrews 4. We have a high priest who understands our weaknesses. 
and the liabilities that we have to temptation because he's been t he's been tempted he has been tempted in every point just like we have yet he never sinned it's going to take a lifetime and i know that we won't have 100% arrived when jesus comes but our goal our goal as christians should be to endure everything with good temper Thank you for your tremendous response. <laughs> Our goal should be to go through anything and remain the same. The same in hard times as in good times. Do you know that nothing ever got Jesus to lose his power? Nothing ever moved him to start saying stupid things that would drain his power. Let's look at John 14:30. He was talking to his disciples and it was it was just perhaps hours away from when he was going to enter into his great suffering in Gethsemane. The time what he had come for, what he had been prepared for was about to happen. Now let's look at what he said to them. I will not talk with you much more. Oh my gosh. How much better off we would be. At least I know I would in a lot of situations. Maybe not you, but in a lot of situations I'd be so much better off when the pressure comes if I would just say to myself, "Shut up." <laughs> Because anything we say when we're frustrated is not going to be anything that needs to be said. not unless we're under a lot of discipline and self-control. I will not talk with you much more for the prince, the evil genius, the ruler of the world is coming. And I love this and he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him and he has no power over me. <laughs> Hallelujah. But what was he saying there? He was saying I'm going to, you know, the pressure's on and I'm not going to be talking much. because the devil has no power over me and I am not going to open my mouth and give him any. Can we look at John 14:30 one more time and I want our television audience to make sure that you're paying attention to this. This is an absolutely amazing scripture. I will not talk with you much more. <laughs> For the prince, the evil genius, the ruler of the world is coming. And he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him. He had navigated every temptation and managed to get through them without sinning. He did it for us. He came and he kept the law perfectly for us. And he said, "Hey, I understand your weaknesses. I understand." those times when you just feel like you can't make it because I've been through them. But he said he has nothing in me and I'm not going to give him anything by losing my cool. Now I know what I'm talking about here tonight is a huge goal. I realize that. A huge goal. But we have to talk about it. If we don't realize that this is our goal and if we don't set this as our direction, then we're just going to keep doing it thinking it's okay. Well, it's not a big deal, you know, at least I'm not committing adultery and stealing. <laughs> well, there's still things that God told us not to do. They may not be one of the big 10, but there's still things that God told us not to do. Amen. Why does Jesus permit these things sometimes when we would so love for him to just take them away so we didn't have to deal with them? Well, in James 1, it says that God never tempts us with evil. Never tempts us with evil, and he cannot be tempted by evil, but we are tempted. We are tempted. When we have lusts and weaknesses and issues and problems in us, that when we get into these trials, then those things come up. You know, there's a scripture in James that says, "Be wholly joyful when you fall into all kinds of trials and temptations, 
knowing that they produce patience. Actually, the Bible says they bring out patience. Well, I want to tell you something. They brought a whole lot of stuff out of me before we ever got around to any patience. I mean, years worth of stuff before we ever found any patience at all. The thing that's interesting, we don't have a problem in our spirit. Jesus lives in there. The Holy Spirit lives in there. And all the fruit of the Spirit is in our renewed spirit. Where we have the problem is in our soul. That uncrucified soul. We have a problem with our mind, with our will, with our feelings. <laughs> Feeling. <laughs> Mercy. And I used to hate those things. Oh my gosh, I hated those things. All those things that brought all that stuff out of me. All those things that brought out the ugliness and the impatience and the jealousy and the frustration and the... I heard somebody say the other day they dropped something, spilled something and just got real angry and was... And then they said, well, every time I spill something, I get mad. Well, but you know what? You, you have to really watch that stuff. I used to be like that. Every time that something would get spilled at the dinner table, you could count on it, I was going to get mad. Well, every night, somebody's got to ruin the meal. Well, the somebody was me, but I didn't know it. It wasn't the glass of milk or the water being spilled that ruined the meal. It, that could be easily wiped up. It was my reaction to what was going on that was ruining it. <laughs> Every night, somebody, it's always somebody. Every night, somebody ruins our meal. And so every night, somebody spilled something so I could throw another fit and the devil could laugh and I could spend one more night in the wilderness and go around the same mountain one more time. Oh my gosh. Well, what are we going to do about it, Joyce? That is the problem. What are we going to do? Galatians, I mean, Colossians 3, 5. I have the answer. It is a biblical answer. I don't know that you'll like it, but it is the answer. <laughs> so kill. <laughs> so kill the flesh. The Amplified says, deaden, deprive of power, the evil desire lurking in your members, not somebody's. Those animal impulses. And all that is earthly in you that is employed in sin, sexual vice, impurity, sensual appetites, unholy desires, greed, covetousness, idolatry, <laughs> on and on and on. So what are you supposed to do to this flesh that's out of control? Kill it. Now, how do you do that? Very simple. You stop feeding it. And I'm not talking about don't eat your supper anymore. That's not what I'm talking about. Every time somebody would spill something and I would have another fit, just like clockwork, I was feeding my flesh, so that meant I gave it strength instead of denying its strength. Anything that you don't feed gets weaker and weaker and weaker until it dies and has no power over you. We have a little seven pound Maltese, little white dog that's nine years old and she is so cute and I feed her. Well now, I mean, I, you know, I let her eat like little pieces of what I'm eating, not just dog food. 
Not much, not enough to hurt her, but a little, little turkey. She loves vegetables. She won't eat fruit, but she'll eat spinach. I mean, anything. She'll eat any kind of vegetable you give her. So now, you know, I've given in to her begging and pleading. Come on, it's just the way the flesh is. I've given in to it so much that now when I sit down and try to eat, she just about drives me crazy. She will jump up in my life and get right in my face. Now, Dave, on the other hand, <laughs> feeds her, but not till he's done eating. And he'll put a piece of what he's going to give her on the side of the plate. And she'll sit there. And just wait. Because he has not let her rule him. He's trained her. She's trained me. <laughs> Come on, do y'all getting this tonight? But now you see, now I could change that. Even though she has, I could change that. And honestly, it would probably only take me a week, 10 days to change that. But I would have to listen to her. I'd have to be willing to hurt her feelings. I'd have to kind of feel like a meanie. You can change anything in your life. You can break any bad habit and you can make a new habit. All you have to do is stop feeding whatever that bad habit is by just doing it over and over. Well, the first few times it's gonna be really hard. I mean, listen, I am telling you the absolute truth. I remember when God started really, really, really dealing with me. I mean, years and years ago about not talking back to Dave when I was mad, you know, just, you know, you know how we are. I had to have the last word. I had to have the last word. And even if it got down to a, do a like, huh, I had to have the last word. <laughs> oh yeah, I was bad. I mean, sometimes he'd walk out of the room and I'd go, Remember the problems in your soul. So I can actually remember, I mean, God was dealing with me and dealing with me and I knew I had to stop it. I knew it was not pleasing to God. And I knew that it wasn't helping our marriage. I knew it was disrespectful because a lot of times I knew he was right about what he was saying, but I still had to mouth off. I know none of you are like that, but <laughs> have I got any relatives out there? And I can honestly remember one time when he said something and I could feel it coming. I don't even know what I'm talking about. It's like, and he's, and the Holy Spirit saying, and I excused myself, ran down the hall, locked myself in the bedroom, bathroom, stuck my face in a towel and went, but I didn't talk back to Dave. And so the next time it was a little bit easier, and the next time it was a little bit easier, and the next time it was a little bit easier, and the next time it was a little bit easier. And you know what? I don't have all that much trouble anymore just saying, yep, you're maybe right. You're probably right. Whatever. Sure. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, every once in a while, I'll still be like, mm. isn't it interesting? That old man dies and we think we got him buried, but we still drag him around in a coffin just in case we need him. <laughs> like Jekyll and Hyde, just in case you want him to come out once in a while. Still got him. Kill the flesh. Don't feed it. Each time we give in to temptation, we feed the problem. Know your weaknesses. And pray. Pray, 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 pray. Lord, help me. Well, I believe one of the main reasons why we fall into temptation is because we don't pray ahead of time to resist the temptation. 
In Jesus' model of prayer, when the disciples asked him to teach them to pray, one of the things he said is, lead us not into temptation. And especially if you have an area in your life where you already know that you tend to have a weakness, you want to make sure that you pray on a regular basis about that. We're here at the Hand of Hope Medical Clinic in Angacha, Ethiopia. And Dave, I just wanted to ask you, what, what are you feeling as you come here and see the work that God's allowing us to do? Uh, I'm feeling humbled. I'm feeling thrilled, excited about what God's given us an opportunity to do. Uh, you know, when, when I look at this place, it was a rundown wreck at one time, and now it's so beautiful. The grounds are uh, actually, they say they're therapeutic to the people here, yeah, right. and uh, the people are excited about what what has happened here. But we're excited about what God is doing, how He's helping the people here. We're in Ngacha, Ethiopia. We have the opportunity to yeah. help hurting people, and that's our goal, that's our desire, that's our hunger for, for Joyce Meyer Ministry. Well, one thing's for sure, we certainly love helping people and to see the smiles on the kids' faces and and to see the hope in their parents' eyes is just a, a phenomenal blessing. I can honestly say, I don't think that there's anything in the world that's better or gives you a better feeling than knowing that you're making a positive difference in somebody else's life. I love to be able to put a smile on someone's face. Thank you for helping us do that. You know, I don't think that we can underestimate the power of habits in our lives. First, we form habits, and eventually they form us. In my new book, Making Good Habits, Breaking Bad Habits, you'll discover that the freedom from bad habits lies in filling your life with one good habit after another. And with God's help, I believe you can put an end to struggling with bad habits and discover a new level of success in your life. Get my new book today. In dit boek vertelt Joyce hoe het aanleren van goede gewoonten je leven kan verbeteren. Nu ook verkrijgbaar op DVD. En profiteer van de setkorting via onze website joyce-meijer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100.